Hey everybody, this is Tommy Miller. I'm the senior pastor at Legacy Church. We're really excited that you decided to join our podcast this morning. Our intention is to give you the information and the resources that you need to bring heaven to earth by walking in the fullness of your identity and your destiny. Enjoy the sermon, enjoy your day, be blessed, and do what Jesus did. Good morning. What's happening? Are you guys okay if I go three months on a, on, a, on one subject? That seems like a lot, though. Like, that's a fourth of your year. I don't know if there's any mathematicians in here, but three out of the 12 months that you get to hear in 2020, we've already covered 12 months on the same subject. What's funny is it's the third week of 2021, and you didn't catch that either. All right, so... Are you guys enjoying the Finding Grace series? Okay. So every once in a while, something, uh, well, actually all the time, something amazing happens. But this week, I had an emerging prophetic voice in our life write me and tell me what to preach. (coughs) And I always need some confirmation on those things. So just to give you a little background, I wouldn't normally preach this message on a Sunday, even though I think you're all going to like it. But I was asking God in my office for permission to preach this sometime. And, uh, and, and, and one of the, the prophetic people that, that has been consistently accurate in, uh, in our life and ministry wrote me and asked a few questions, and then, and then she said, this is what you need to preach. Don't hold back and, uh, and just let it fly. So I'm going to trust that my insecurities were carnal and that your hearts are ready. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and we're going to talk about something specific today. I'm going to ask when you hear some terminology, this is what it really all comes down to. Is sometimes when you use specific terminology, people associate a doctrine with a term. And then when I use a different term, you assume that I'm talking about a different doctrine. And that's not always the case. So, um, can you follow me? Is that all right? All right. So, <clears throat> the, the title of my message is The Lion and the Lamb. Okay, and I want to point out something very specific. As a matter of fact, uh, let's pray first. And if anybody's got, knows where our waters are, you grab me one, I would greatly appreciate it. <clears throat> Father, we ask right now that, uh, that whatever you desire to speak this morning, we're speaking uh, at the unction of a prophetic voice that we love and trust. And I'm just asking that you bless it, grace it, and let us bring unity and not division to the body. Yeah. And that you open our minds and hearts, that your Holy Spirit be with us to bear witness as we hear things that maybe contradict what we've believed before. We ask these things in Jesus' name, and everybody said, <coughs> amen. All right, so in, in Western culture, one of the things that we're famous for all around the world is something called exclusive truth or exclusivity of truth. And what that means, if it is one thing, it can't be another. Uh, philosophers would call it the either-or paradigm, right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Okay, so when we consider Scripture, oftentimes it's seen through the lens of our either or paradigm. And what that does is it causes us to not allow two things to be true simultaneously when it comes to scripture. And that costs us sometimes. For instance, thank you so much. When, when the book of John says that Jesus was the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth, we immediately interpret it because of our paradigm is that he was full of grace or truth. Right? And that's not how Jesus functioned, even though it's the way we function. Consider this. If you see a homeless crackhead on the side of the road, your normal Christian, like, I'll call it like your false face, is like, oh, Jesus loves them, and Jesus died for them, and you might even shed a tear, like they don't know who they are. But then your spouse comes against you, and you immediately get skeptical, like who you think you are. 
right? Because you can't be full of grace and truth at the same time because we have to live in that one or the other dichotomy. So if I know the truth about you, then I can't extend grace to you because I understand your motivation. So grace and truth can't go at the same time. But if I don't know the truth about somebody, then it's easy to extend grace to them because in my Western understanding, I'm grace or truth. I'm not full of grace and truth because it's difficult for us as Westerners to know everything about somebody, their motivations, intentions, uh, the things that they've done wrong, the things that they've done that were purposely using and, and, and inciting you to jealousy or wrath, and then say, it's okay, I forgive you and I love you. It's tough because grace and truth don't seem like they can coexist. But Jesus was full of grace and truth. And he functioned frequently, as a matter of fact, all of the time. His identity was the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So he could know, as a matter of fact, he did know the entire truth and was able to extend the fullness of grace. People got so caught up in their, their paradigm that even the woman at the well, he has to display to her that he can be full of grace and truth at the same time. He extends <coughs> grace or an invitation to salvation to her, and he understands, like, how would you feel if you met the Messiah and you were, like, maybe in a relationship that wasn't so fit, and he's like, hey, come to church, like, okay, and then you never show up. Why do you never show up? Because you think Jesus doesn't know what you're doing behind his back. But Jesus functions in the spiritual gift of the word of knowledge. He says, why don't you go tell your husband about our conversation? And she says, I don't have a husband. And that's where she's going to leave it. And Jesus says, you have rightly said. You don't have a husband. You've had six. Excuse me, you've had five, and the one you have now is somebody else's. Right? So why would he bring something like that out? Because he's intentionally letting her know, I've got no mysteries concerning your life. I know what you've smoked. I know you who you've laid with. Grace. <laughs> but one of these nuances that we have to get our mind around is that he's the lion and the lamb. He's not the lion or the lamb. If you believe he's the lion or the lamb, then you will be forced to create a doctrine that only allows him to function in one of his emotions or motivations at a time. And do you know what that does? It causes you, <laughs> it causes you to receive only one side of his gospel narrative. And then you push the other half out into your future. Because if, how many times have you heard it? He came as the lion, but he will come as the lamb. <laughs> Wait, that was backwards. Dang it. <laughs> All that energy. <clears throat> Everybody tries to scare you by saying, he came as a lamb. Like, he came as the cool hippie guy that forgave all the sin, but he's coming back. He's going to eat you. Because we can't fathom a guy that can be the lion and the lamb at the same time. We can't fathom a guy that's picking a prostitute off the ground while he's poking an evil eye at the Pharisees. While he was loving this woman, he was at the same time crushing religion. He was the lion and the lamb simultaneously. While he was giving up his life on the cross, he looked like a suffering servant. He was given two heavenly middle to death. I almost went there. <laughs> Everybody thinks I'm going to say it, and they blurted it out on the live stream. <laughs> hey, look, wait, this is what we do as Christians. This is our Christian middle finger. I'll pray for you. <laughs> right? Did I not say middle finger the first time, then say it the second time? I do that all the time. But do you understand like how incredible this man is? Like he's able to completely dismantle something while he's loving and caring for something else. He's able to pull an oxen out of a ditch while he's giving Pharisees ulcers. He's unbelievable. 
I'm overwhelmed by who he is, and I can't stand when we put him in the box, because when we put him in the box, we're like, we, we reduce his ministry on earth to this just like love, peace, and joy hippie, and he never did anything that was malicious or, or violent, but he was so violent. But he had the ability, do you guys remember the Chronicles of Narnia? Do you remember when the little gopher was describing Aslan? He's like, Aslan's coming. He's talking about this lion, and he's like, is he safe? And he said, heavens, no. <laughs> but he's good. What a perfect description of our Messiah. No, he's not safe. If you're hell, if you're death, if you're the grave, if you're sickness, if you're anxiety, if you're depression, you've got one coming. He will spare no mercy. He will take you completely out. But if you're the apple of his eye, his only begotten monogene creation, there's nothing he won't give you. He's simultaneously a lion and the lamb. We can't move his lion-like attributes out into the future and think for a moment that they're going to turn on us. Everyone makes you think that he's coming back to kill you. And the same Savior that is the lion and the lamb is coming back to reign with you. Man. <laughs> He messes me up. I can't believe someone existed like him. And not only that, I can't believe someone existed like him. And then he said, you are as I am. His whole life was a paradox. He was born to die. He died to live. He was overcome so he could overcome. He's forsaken by the Father, so you could be accepted. His whole life, he was a simultaneous lion and lamb. Can you imagine like what they were seeing in the spirit while he was picking up a prostitute? You know Satan's only ammunition is religion? That's what he does? He makes you live according to your senses and your performance? So while these eyes of love are looking into this woman who's been cast at his feet and accused, his eyes of fire are looking at the religious spirit and saying, don't you come near her. Simultaneously, at the same time. <sighs> I can't handle him. I don't even, like, what I feel about him right now is, is about a hundred times more than what I'm able to communicate. You ever been to the zoo and seen a male lion? How many of y'all want to crawl up in the cage with him? No. No, it's, it's, it's just a, some things happen, not for a good reason, but because you're stupid and make bad decisions, right? That was judgmental. Nobody wants to roll inside that cage. Why? Because he's dangerous. Yet, one of his cubs is tucked into his ribcage. Is he any less dangerous? No, but he's good. One of the, the things that can cost humanity the most is not being able to see him according to this perfect paradigm. Jesus even goes as far as to, put, to pull this into a parable. Just to let us understand that he is the lion and the lamb. He can kill for you while he's picking you up. He can sling a sword while he's dragging the wounded. He is able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than you can ask or think. And just because you can't, doesn't mean he can't. Doesn't mean you can't be mad at something and love something else. Doesn't mean it's not possible for him. And you, when you reduce him to human ability and not the identity of divinity, then you're forced to take his other character attributes and put them somewhere else in time. 
We do it. We do it when we think it's fit. If we don't want judged right now, we'll just say, well, he came as the lamb. I don't think killing death and tormenting torment was very lamb-like. He was able to do both and never sacrifice the fullness of his identity. But if we have to split these attributes, then we will pick a convenient time to experience them. And it's probably not in your generation. Right? It's one of the most famously preached messages around our country. It's called the message of fear. Mm -hmm. It's you got lucky the first time. Next time he comes back, he's got teeth instead of wool. Next time he comes back, he's got claws instead of hooves. Next time he comes back, he better find you at your best behavior. Or he's going to dismember you bit by bit. And then proudly wear a cloak soaked in your blood. Act like you haven't heard that message preached. He's coming back as the lion. He was here as the lion. When he comes back, it's ridiculous for us to think of this God that says, I am. And I do not change. Mm -hmm. To think that we would experience anything other than the perfect synthesis of power and love forever. The one that's a savior enough to lay his life down for us, but powerful enough to kill death while he does it. Mm -hmm. oh, like, this dude is unreal. We had a late Christmas celebration yesterday at my family's house, and uh, my nieces and nephews sang, uh, Mary, did you know? Every line of that song just penetrated my heart because Mary was a human, right? She was a human being found to be blessed and highly favored. And then she gets to raise. When you kiss that little baby, you kiss the face of God. He was a baby and God at the same time. I can't handle him. He's too much. What was that? S.M. Lockridge? You guys ever heard of him? That's my king. Look that up when you get home. So funny. The whole time he's saying, I, he's indescribable. And then he keeps describing him. <laughs> he's like, I can't say anything about him. And then he keeps going. It's incredible. But anyway, <clears throat> this is what I want to address. Okay, So there is, there is a doctrine that is formed out of a lack of understanding of his ability to be more than one thing at a time. And what happens is you take what you see in the natural. What you see in the Gospels in the natural is that he helps sinners, he loved the outcasts, and then you assume that he just must be on his lamb-like mission. And if he's on his lamb-like mission and the Bible says that he is a lion and a lamb, then you must think that the lion portion of him has to come at a later date and it's coming for judgment and it's coming for vengeance and it's coming for pain. Because you were unable to see with eyes of the Spirit that He killed death, that He defeated hell, that He rose from the grave, all of those things being expressions of His ability to kill. One of the greatest expressions of love is that you hate the right thing. Did you hear that? We got together like three years ago, and God gave me that word for our youth camp. One of the greatest expressions of love is that you hate the right thing. And we got around and we talked about what we hated. We hate that out of those 120 kids, statistically 10 of them are being molested at home. We hate that there's statistical, like that, that, that those measures even exist to let us know that some of them have already been abandoned by both parents. One of the greatest expressions of love is hating the right thing. And you have to come to the conclusion. You have to come to a place where you can do that. I hate death. I mean, you don't, you don't know. I hate death. I can't even watch movies where people die without getting up off the couch and like punching the TV. 
I hate death. Do you know why I hate death? Because it's an enemy of humanity and my Savior hated it too. Yep. It's an enemy of my Savior. Okay, so. I'm stalling. Where do you want to go after this? I know where I want to go. Go to Matthew 24. So last Tuesday night, we have 34 academy students this year. Oh, it's a phenomenal group. They're outrageous. If you're in the academy, stand up real quick. Yeah, it's a good group. And my intention was for the first three weeks would lay a foundation of, of essentially the paradigm that you need to have to be able to understand the rest of the year. And the three principles that we're going to cover these three weeks are God is good, the future is bright, and I'm responsible. Mm -hmm. And we started with I'm responsible, and somehow we got to the future is bright. But as I was preparing this week, those, those scripture, scriptures echoed in my heart again, and I was asking God for permission, and then a prophet said, you need to preach that message. So I'm going to show you something that you might not like, and uh, that's your problem. <clears throat> but I think you'll like it. All I'm going to ask is that you be open-minded, okay? How many of you believe that the future is bright? Okay. How many of you have heard the church preach a much different message than that? hell in a handbasket. They cite the end of the book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. How do you think a Jesus that came to earth as a lion and a lamb to defeat hell, death, and the grave feels about a gospel that exalts hell, death, and the grave as the ultimate end of humanity? He's probably not super stoked about it, right? So in the news, there are, there's political unrest, there's pandemic, there's things going on in the world that we've never seen in our lifetime. I would submit to you that they have seen it in lifetimes past. So it's not, I don't know, like bubonic plague, Ebola, like these things have happened. I love that when that happens. <laughs> <coughs> so it, it is kind of selfish of us to think that just because we're in trouble that the end is near, <laughs> right? <laughs> just because we're in trouble, the end is near. If you read, there's a, a historian named Josephus from the first century that recorded all of the events that surrounded the fall of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. You will read some things that will cause you to lose sleep. Because Matthew 24 outlines exactly what happened in that time. It says there's famines, there's pestilence. It says never will there be and never again has there seen such great tribulation in the world. Most people believe that because of the, the unrest that we're experiencing now that it's going to go downhill into more tribulation because the church has been taught that there's tribulation coming. Because we've effectively taken scriptures out of context to make our future look bleak. And what happens when you think your ship is sinking is you just start playing with the band. Right? You guys have seen the Titanic, right? There comes a point where you stop shoveling the water out and you just pick up the violin and start playing a sad song. What I said was profound. Hilarious, but profound. Because, as Chris Volatin said, it is impossible to get the crew to polish the deck on a sinking ship. So if you believe that your future holds nothing but pain, 
death and tribulation, then you will not take responsibility for your portion, your influence in the kingdom to bring light into darkness. Because the characteristic of the very kingdom that he returned with 2,000 years ago as the lion and the lamb, he said that when I ascend, I will come back and be in you. And that joy, no one will take from you. He said of the kingdom and his peace, there will be no end of the increase of his government and peace. It will never stop. The only way it stops is if you stop. So if you believe doctrinally that it's going to get bad, then you will create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yep. Because everything that happens in the earth is the result of human agreement. Yep. I'm going to read you something. <laughs> you in Matthew 24? Go to verse 3. This is the passage that everybody uses to warn you about how bad it's going to get. This was referred to as the Olivet Discourse. Okay? And it says in verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us when will these things be? Everybody say, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. Okay? Wow. <laughs> Profound. So they ask him a question, right? When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? What are these things? Here's the deal. If you don't look at context, you have to superimpose your own idea. You have to speculate what question you think they're, answer or they're asking. But holy cannoli, wouldn't you know it, the first two verses of that chapter tell you exactly what question they're asking. I don't think you're with me yet. Are you with me yet? Okay. So let's go back to verse 1. Jesus went and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. Jesus said to them, do, not, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. When? Right? Is that what it says or is that not what it says? How would we ever superimpose our idea of the end of the world and the seven year tribulation over something so simple to understand? What if we were sitting on my front porch? As a matter of fact, this happened. Any of y'all from like Port Janaton, Tusky here recently? We were at 9.39 p.m. a few nights ago. Me, my wife, and my dog were sitting on the, the, the couch, and my whole house went. Poof. And we all jumped up at the same time. A house exploded two towns over. People felt it from Yorksville all the way down to Port Washington. Wow. Nobody was hurt, praise God. Okay, but check this out. Imagine we're on my porch, and I say, see that house over there? Mm -hmm. Sucker's going to blow up. And then somebody goes, ooh, when? I say, well, when you see wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, armies moving in, it's about to happen. What's about to happen? Where were you for the first part of our conversation? <laughs> the house is going to blow up. Okay. And then he immediately turns from Jesus and says, Hey, everybody, I know when the end of the world is. Wait, I said that. I said the building is going to blow up. We're having a conversation about the Jewish temple in Jerusalem. So when the disciples ask Jesus, Tell us when will these things be? He is telling them when the temple is going to be destroyed. Why is that important? Because it's not when the earth is going to be destroyed. Because he says he will never leave his creation. Of the increase in his government and peace, there will be no end. So he has to, we have to, be responsible Bereans when it comes to reading the Bible and not listen to the fear-mongering message that's been preached in Western culture. Right? 
Would you believe I'm holding back because I'm still afraid of you? <laughs> okay, so check this out. <coughs> so he asked three questions, fairly enough, all right? When will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? All right? Age always meant like a, a dispensation. All right? And the coming of the Lord wasn't always a visible return because he came to cities in judgment frequently in the Old Testament. He wasn't visible. The city just blew up. Right? He came to Sodom and Gomorrah. Boom! That was a coming of the Lord. Right? He is coming to 70 AD. The Jewish temple will be destroyed. Let me ask you this question. Did you ever take the time to say, how can it be like a thief in the night and the trumpet of God at the same time? It's not. It's two different events. He came to judge the Jewish system like a thief in the night. And he's coming back as the Lord of glory with trumpets in a cloud. Yeah. It's not the same thing. So, lion, lamb, right? Let's read this real quick and I'll explain this, this whole passage to you. And I'll cite some history for you. Okay. Jesus went out and departed from the temple. His disciples said, when's that thing going to blow up? And he sat on the Mount of Olives and said, excuse me, they said, when will these things be and what will be the sign of your coming in the end of the age? Jesus said, make sure... Nobody lies to you about this. Right? Uh -huh. Make sure nobody lies to you about this because it'll cost you. Ready? For many will come in my name saying, I'm the Christ and deceive many. You'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. These are the beginning of sorrows. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You'll be hated for all nations by my name's sake. And then many will be offended and betray one another and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawless will abound, the love of many will wax cold. But he who endures till the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all the world as a witness to all nations. And the end, then the end will come. Okay. <coughs> if you read Josephus' book called Wars... He was a non-Christian historian that documented what happened from the time of this prophecy until 70 AD. And he, like I said, if you read it, you'll, you'll lose sleep. Because mothers were so afraid of what was coming, they ate their children. The famine was so great, and they were so afraid of what was coming, they ate their children. Right? It's that bad. So, see that temple? Not a stone will be left upon the other. Tell us when will these things be. Well, when you see wars, rumors of wars, famines, pestilence, that's the beginning of sorrows. Right? Okay, here's the lion and the lamb simultaneously. This is so cool. All right. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Everybody say abomination of desolation. All right, so according to most of our Tim LaHaye theology and left behind stuff, that's the Antichrist, right? Okay, turn to Luke 14, I think. I hope it is, because if not, we'll be a minute. Oh, man, it's not... Right, you have to give me a minute and don't judge me. I know where it is. Why am I thinking Luke 10? Is it Luke 10? Nope, it's Luke 21. Sorry about that, guys. Okay, just, just so, oh, is it, okay, it is Luke 21. <clears throat> okay, so Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there are, there are frequent parallels that, where these authors all recorded the same 
uh, experience with Jesus, right? So Matthew 24 is about the Olivet Discourse. Luke 21 is about the Olivet Discourse. Everybody remembers Matthew's language where he said the abomination of desolation. Really vague term kind of lends itself to some of the the fear-mongering talk of the future. Luke doesn't use that language. Luke says, oh, verse 20. But when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that desolation is near. More clarity, right? Okay. Same spot, same parallel. If you read before this, it says, but all these things, they will lay their hands on you, persecute you, deliver you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and rulers. Uh, It will turn out for you as an occasion of testimony, settle in your hearts, not to meditate beforehand. So this is the same conversation with Jesus. But Matthew says, abomination of desolation. Luke says, Jerusalem surrounded by armies. So the abomination of desolation isn't some favored politician. It's not Obama. It is the Roman army that surrounded Jerusalem in 70 AD. Painfully clear. Right? Okay, check this out. Um, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. We're probably going to stop there with this principle, but this is why. Um, Christians in the first century referred to people of the way, right? The people of the way. And Josephus records, how many people do you think died in the Roman destruction of Jerusalem? How many believers do you think died? during the Roman destruction of Jerusalem? Zero. Why do you think? What's that? They obeyed. They had a prophetic warning. When you see this, get out of Dodge. The end is near. So they had no inkling to take this as some kind of cataclysmic end of the world. They knew exactly what this was about. They knew that the Jewish system, the sacrificial system, would finally come to an end because God would harden the hearts of Rome, bring them against Jerusalem, and crush the temple. And when that happened, 13 million Jewish people got murdered and zero Messianic Christians. Because it says when this happens... If you're in Judea, go to the mountains. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Okay. (coughs) We're almost there. Uh, Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. How many of y'all chill on housetops? I mean, just fair, fair Berean questions. How many of y'all chill on housetops? Don't fib to me. It was common It was common in Jerusalem and Judea to have a a sitting place on housetops. They had a network of housetops they could get from. You ever watch Aladdin? Yeah. We think, ooh, he's like a gymnast. No, no, that's just how they rolled back then. Be over, neighbor. (laughs) All right, and let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. Is he naked in the field? I never saw that before. That just... Okay. <clears throat> now here's the one that should give us some insight to the, to the context. Um, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. Okay, so clearly, a mother who's nursing will be slowed down, right? In winter, people died when they had to travel long ways because they didn't have uh, air or heat in their camels. (laughs) But pray that your flight is not on the Sabbath. This gives us a huge indicator to its internal time context. Because if you were in Judea, There were Pharisees and Sadducees enforcing Jewish law. And on the Sabbath, you couldn't go any further than what was referred to as a Sabbath day's walk. 
If somebody saw you walk more than, I think it was like 300 kilometers, it's, it's not real far, like a quarter mile. That's not right, three quarters of a mile. If somebody saw you go further than that, they'd take you prisoner because you were disobeying the Mosaic law. You could even be stoned dead for it because you weren't observing the Sabbath, the holy day, right? So he's like, you better hope that when it's time to run, it's not a Sabbath because they're going to come try to get some of you because you're walking too far. You won't be able to be inconspicuous about your departure. Okay, so why do I say all that? Because when we see the news, the first thing that somebody types is, I know that we're in the last days, and I know that the future is grim, and I know that this is the Lord's judgment coming upon the earth. No! This is the lack of revelation of the church knowing that they are the solution to the world's problems and believing in a self-fulfilling prophecy that we're supposed to bring increase to His government and peace. We're the light of the world. It is absolutely heinous to think that darkness can overcome us. But that message has come across our pulpit. Satan didn't have to preach it. Oh, man. Now what do you want to do? Okay. Um, I'll go here. I wasn't going to, but my, my academy students will appreciate the refresher. Okay, <clears throat> the book of Amos chapter 3 verse 7 says, Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, first. Okay, so prophets know what God's going to do. That's why when prophets speak, even now about politics, you should revere their word. Yep, because they all have a pretty common and similar message right now. But... What that passage in Amos tells you is that God won't do anything unless he shows his secret to a prophet first. Mm -hmm. So if you can't find your doctrine in the mouth of a prophet, it's not right. The details of the new covenant were spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. They didn't know what they were talking about. But the details of the new covenant were spoken of by the Old Testament prophets. You know what I can't find the Old Testament prophets saying? And in those days, they'll elect a bad president and the world will fall to crap and we'll go to hell in a handbasket. <clears throat> I can't find it. And in those days, they'll use the pulpits to scare the hell out of people, get them to repeat a prayer, and hopefully they make it to heaven when they die. I can't find prophets saying that. I can't find this reduced Western gospel in the mouth of Isaiah. I can't find it in the mouth of Jeremiah. I can't find Ezekiel talking about it. And if God says, I'm not going to do it unless they say it, then I have to know that the prophetic framework is already laid for what he intends to do. And then as a responsible believer, I have to revere the word of the prophets to know what to expect in my future. I'm going to read you some of them. Ready? <laughs> and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Put that in your offering plate and pass it. <laughs> Ready? Hmm. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. Yeah. Right? Daniel 7 says, I was watching in the night visions. Behold, one like the Son of Man came in the clouds of heaven, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom. Then all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall never pass away, and his kingdom the one that shall never be destroyed. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit within my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near to those who stood by and asked him the truth of all these things. And he says, these great beasts that are four are four kings that shall arise out of the earth. But, everybody say but. Ah, the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and even ever. Now, I can tell you exactly who those kings were. I'm not going to, but I can tell you exactly who those kings were. But let's pretend I couldn't. 
Does it matter what kings rise out of the earth? Because the, king, the kingdom is coming to the saints of the Most High God. Not the politicians. The saints of the Most High God. And it will be theirs forever. Yes. Oh man. We're in trouble. Daniel 7.27 The kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. This is the end of the account. This is the end of the account. As for me, Daniel, my thoughts greatly troubled me, and my countenance changed, and I kept the matter in my heart. God does nothing, nothing, without telling his secrets to the prophets first. So if you can't find your theology in the mouth of a prophet, you have to change it, right? And we can't reduce Jesus to the lamb that came before and then, and then create a lion that's coming later because he was the lion and the lamb when he came then. He's the lion and the lamb when he came now. And his intentions towards you, his love, grace, and mercy when he comes then aren't going to change. But he's coming to a new heaven and a new earth to reign with his saints on earth forever. And we're not, listen, I'm sorry, I'm, so, I'm not sorry. I'm sorry that I'm not sorry. You don't have to go through hell and get pulled through a knothole backwards just to make it there. Of the increase and his government, there will be no end. I want to provide some context without attitude, okay? A gospel that positions a God as great enough to sustain his saints through every single circumstance is not a fluffy gospel. A gospel that positions a God to justify every sinner is not greasy grace. It's a great God. Yes. To say that there are sins that were too much for him to cover or that's tribulation for him that, that is too much to sustain, it makes little of his ability. It makes little of his nature. And when he's able to equip a company of people that collectively believe no matter what happens in our future, we run this thing. No matter what kings arise out of the earth, the kingdom is given to the saints of the Most High God. I am not established one nation under God. I am established as he is over this nation. Okay, I have to stop or we're going to get in more trouble. <clears throat> so here's what I don't want to do. Let me be clear about some things. My wife's always like, make sure, like... Will there be a moment when the church and the dead in Christ will meet? Yes. Okay? I'm not coming after your rapture theory. Although if we had a private conversation, I would destroy it. <laughs> is Jesus coming back as the Lord of glory? Yes. You bet he is. Yep. I am not... I am not a full preterist. That's what you'd label, label me as, as though Jesus accomplished everything on the cross and then we just get better until we don't die anymore. That's what full preterism is. I'm not one of those. Okay? I believe it is the responsibility of the church in this age to make heaven manifest on earth. And when we've built according to the pattern, Jesus will transcend his creation. He'll bring with him all who sleep in Jesus. Yep. And then they will be reconciled to their bodies and we will be changed. That's scripture. Yep. Yep. So, so don't throw me in the boats with the crazies. I'm crazier than most, but I'm not as crazy as the crazies. But here's, here's what we need to, to get a handle of, man. You can't live in fear. You can't be afraid of tomorrow. You can't be afraid of who gets in office. You can't be afraid that the Constitution is going to be... Listen, you've never been governed by that thing. And just because they take away natural freedoms... Listen, they did that to Paul. Paul was more free in jail than most of you are in the United States. Yep. 
<laughs> okay. Your future's bright. You can stop. I mean, how much peace does this give you? You can stop trying to speculate who <laughs> the Antichrist is, when the tribulation starts, when the temple's going to go up. You can stop all that stuff. It is finished. Here's, here's my favorite one. The reason they say that the tribulation is seven years is because they, they use a Daniel prophecy to get the time frame because Matthew 24 never says seven years. It just says there'll be a lot of tribulation. Mm -hmm. In the Daniel prophecy, it says that Behold, he will make a covenant with many for one week. And in the middle of the covenant, he'll bring an end to sacrifice and offering in the temple. And everyone's like, oh, how could he? Because he laid his life down once and for all. It was Jesus. It wasn't your antichrist. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Listen, this is what's cool about it too. So you realize that Jesus was in ministry for three and a half years mm -hmm. when he spoke of the covenant. He made the covenant with Jews. Mm -hmm. He made the covenant with Jews. His, his first converts were Jewish converts. Three and a half years in, he dies. He puts an end to sacrifice and offering. But do you realize that you have to reconcile this or you have bad theology? He says, don't go to the Gentiles, but go first to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Why did he say that? To fulfill Daniel. Because he had to make a covenant with them for a week. So three and a half years after his death, he finds Stephen and Cornelius, the first Gentile converts. So he went after the Jews for a full seven years. That seven-year time frame is the one that we superimpose over Matthew 24 to get a seven-year tribulation because we think that, that, I mean, imagine this. This is the way people see it, that some fake religious leader stands in the temple and is like, ha, no more sacrifices. But instead, Jesus was like, you don't need any more sacrifices. Once and for all. Could you imagine being seated at the right hand of God? And for about 400 years, people thinking that the scripture that is about your final defeat of the messianic system is about the antichrist. Jesus is like, somebody got to get this. Someday. All right, let's recap. Your future's bright. You're responsible. If you're waiting for the end, if you're waiting for destruction, you'll cause it. You'll cause it by your apathy You'll cause it by your inability to stay motivated because you think the thing's going to blow up anyway. Nobody starts working on something that's going to blow up. But if you realize that it, you are fully responsible to manifest the fullness of heaven on earth so that everybody can see the knowledge of the Lord, then you'll start fresh and know that your labor is not in vain. Amen? Amen. Stand with me. <clears throat> if any of you have questions because I, I, I believe that probably 75% of western culture especially since the, the popularity of like the, the Tim LaHaye movies were probably pre-tribulation rapture believers um, if you need to sort any of that stuff out and want to do like a Zoom call or write me or whatever, I really do care. And, I, and here, here's the other thing. If you don't agree with me, I do not require agreement for relationship. That is a very shallow Amen. relationship. Amen. So if you, <laughs> <yeah. coughs> if, if you want to participate here and be here and, and be part of this, you can hold fast to your pre-tribulation rapture theory and I will still love you endlessly. It's okay. All right? And I'll, I'll never treat you like you're wrong either because your opinion matters. Amen?
I mean that. All right. Um, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this morning. We ask right now that the word that was preached this morning uh, just sink into our hearts, God. You are the lion and the lamb. You're the one that doesn't change. The one that came and was our protector and defender is going to stay that way yes. forever and ever and even ever. Father, we thank you that the saints of the Most High are the ones that will possess the kingdom and that that kingdom will never be destroyed. And all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdom of our God. Yes. Father, we thank you for a hopeful view of our future and we thank you that you are the one that has instilled eternity into the heart of every man. We know that a hopeful future is our portion. Lord, we ask these things in Jesus' name and everybody said... Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a shout this morning.